please welcome Max Wittrock, uh, co-founder and managing director of My Muesli. Always in closing. Uh, <laughs> you have a Christmas granola. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. Um, I think we have it. Do I have to switch it on? Yes. Um, I think we have it. Yeah, I think it's the sixth or seventh granola or Christmas granola season. So um, tell me a little bit. Um, I've read, so you started in 2000, you started in 2005, I guess, with an idea that uh, came out of a road trip to a, to a zee, uh, to a lake uh, near, near Passau, um, where you, you kind of uh, listened to a radio commercial about a traditional um, muesli manufacturer, and you were there. Well, um, hold on, hasn't been any innovation into the muesli space for ages. It's still very traditional, very dusty. And that's where you came up with the idea of my muesli, with your two co-founders, uh, Hubertus Bessau and, and Philipp Kreis. Yeah, that, that's basically how it happened. So I'm, I'm really bad at giving short answers, so you need to throw something if it's, if, if it's getting too long. So um, we, we studied in Passau, and for those of you who have been to Passau, you know that there is nothing you can do in the summer if you're except drive to a nearby lake. So we drove to that lake and we heard a radio commercial that has been around in Germany for decades, I think. And, and it got us thinking because I, I think that the, the really good startups mostly start with luck or by pure accident. They don't start because you look at diagrams and you think, this sector is very interesting. That's how we should tackle it. And you come up with a great idea. Oh, you would be surprised. I've interviewed a lot of ex-consultants that come up with an idea like this. <laughs> yeah, but um, like if you look at if you look at startups like Facebook or Airbnb, if you if you if you've seen that um, the, the Altman lecture, how to start a startup from my Combinator, he, he he basically argues um, in the same direction. He says that you know. Um, it's the it's the funny ideas, the cool ideas, the, the where you the, have a passion, basically, where you feel like exactly very close because to the you, product. you have to love what you're doing. And we didn't know back then; it wasn't love on first sight. So we didn't know back then that we would love muesli very dearly. But um, <laughs> it we, took you actually two years that's from right, the so idea to actually launching, right? Exactly, two thousand seven. So we, when we heard that commercial, we so when you meet a close friend, I think one of the very few topics you will address in the first three minutes is muesli. You know, like, what's in your bowl every morning? That's not the typical question to ask, So, you, but you rarely have a chance to talk about muesli with friends. So we saw three things. We, we talked about it and we saw that no one had done premium before. And we thought that, is, that was strange, because especially when it comes to fast-moving consumer and retail goods, you know, there's always space for a premium niche or for a premium product. And second, we saw that no one had done it's really hard to find an adjective for that, like a street credible cool brand, like the Supreme of, of Muesli. And then third, no one had done like an online product. No one had used the internet to sell Muesli. But the problem was that these three things combined aren't really strong in terms of a unique selling proposition. So gladly one of my co-founders who bad just came up with the idea of mass customized Muesli, but it took us yeah, one and a half years to, to finish um, our studies and then to, to start the company. What do you mean by mass customization, actually? So, um, the term mass customization refers to producing um, individual goods, but using mass technology or mass production techniques. So, you, you combine two things that go very well together, and we thought that in an age of the internet in an age of technology that um, customized muesli would be the thing to, to have or to eat. So when you launched your, your website in, in 2007 um, and a person could actually basically choose the different ingredients from what you had in stock and build its own muesli. Oh, it, was su it was such a long way to the website because I think um, if, if, if you're German, you might have read um, Gunther Faltin's um, Kopfschlägkapital, which where he basically says, so 
well, first there's the idea, but the really hard part is to, to have like the final concept of a, of a startup, which, which he calls basically an artwork if it's really perfect. And we, it, it took us such a long time to, to go through, say, possible sales channels, like should we open a store, should we carry around little muesli But tables? from 2005 to 2007, um, you started <laughs> to basically think about these think things. Think about the idea. Yeah, and, and, and think about like how could we, because I think the the idea of starting a social network is fairly simple, but and Facebook is not. So I, I don't want to compare my music to Facebook, but just so and you get an idea of like we were sitting in that car in 2005 and we were like, wow, mass customized muesli. But from there to having an online configurator with a pricing system that worked with all the logistics, it was lots of lots of work to do. So where where did you start? Um with, did you start with like um, trying to find out if there was already an interest for that type of product, or did you um, talk to supermarkets to find out if there was a distribution channel that could actually work there? See, um, I think, and um, that that's a good question, like w where to start. And I think, um, when you when you're in a new relationship, when you when you start loving someone, you don't start by saying. We should have a contract of how we handle things. We should set up an account. You know, you talk about the, you do the good stuff. Like you, let's let's go to the movies. So I think that's why consumer goods are so cool because basically what we did was like the creative part, like really thinking about the design. How, yeah, the design, how to sell the product, like what what should it look like, what should it feel like, the name, which is ridiculously mm -hmm. difficult, and um, to come up with a good name, and and later on we we added like these things as of like, how do we set up production, mm -hmm. how do we do logistics, but I think you should really start by doing the cool stuff because you know that what, that's what keeps you going and, and that's why I think a lot of people start with the boring stuff and they do like 30, 40 page presentations that say look at the market and they're like but what about the product? And so I think founders should, should really focus on, on the product first. And apparently the market was not completely convinced about uh, the product. I think you did a market survey where you asked a very specific question which was not very convincing well, for your product. Of course, like, like every founder, we thought that if someone hears that idea, mass customized music, everyone's going to steal it. We have to keep it really secret. Um, so we came up with a questionnaire that was, I think, three or four pages long. And on page three at the bottom or something we asked would you buy muesli online and if you ever do a questionnaire it's like with a master thesis the trick is to convince everyone that it will only take five minutes but in reality it takes 15 but people will only <laughs> realize on the last page and more than 1,000 people actually answered that questionnaire and zero percent said yes I will buy it well gladly there are lots of famous people out there, and um, you probably know that, that Henry Ford quote, if I would have asked people what they really wanted, they would have said faster horses, and so we thought if Henry Ford can do it, <laughs> and, then no joking, like three students from, we thought that people should really see the product, and again, because we loved the idea so much, it, it wasn't that important to us if it, if it really made sense, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm bad with, with remembering quotes, but I think the Sam Altman quote from Y Combinator is, Really, um, it's the it's the funny ideas that you know are the greatest ones, or something like that, or the not the so craziest. yeah. The, and and I think he's he's really really right about that. And um, and of course, my muesli is is a very small company compared to a lot of startups out there. And um, but we still love the product, and it it makes us happy, and it makes other people happy. And I think that's what what's really cool about it. And when you started, did you figure out that you had the right um, team combination that uh, with uh, Philippe and Aubertus you were kind of having uh, an, an, a complementary skill set um, and a team dynamic that would work in the future, would we convince of, of the team? So, good question. Like, um, I, I think checking the, the team box is also a very hard part, but for us, um, we really lucked out because I think it's so difficult when eight graphic designers come together and they want to start a graphic design agency, but no one wants to do the taxes. So that that's really <laughs> tough. But but if you have like, I I 
went to law school and I also did an apprenticeship in journalism. I, I worked for small local newspapers in Passau and Hubertus was really into marketing and, and Philip, and, and he still is, and Philip still is into, into numbers. He, he loves to do finance stuff, he's into operations. And we were really complementary without thinking about it. And that is and, and was really, really cool. So when you launched the website in, I think it was 1st of May 2007, so uh, kind of 10 years ago, um, what was kind of ready and what was still like, um, you know, we'll decide then when, when we have customers? So back then, the Internet Stone Age, and it, it was really difficult to learn how to program a website because the, um, there were no YouTube tutorials, so Hubertus, who, who finished in university, I think, five months earlier than, than the two of us did, uh, Philip and me, he, he had to read through all these books, like PHP programming and... Uh, so becoming an expert, kind of. Exactly, and so that's... And he really programmed the website all by himself, even the configurator, but there was one slight glitch because the website didn't work on the Internet Explorer and back then I think 71% of all users <laughs> used the Internet Explorer but the cool thing was that the website didn't tell you right away you did all the customization you clicked order and then it, it failed yeah, it didn't start. <laughs> so it was and very frustrating I guess exactly so and I think that when when people ask you that it's like what would you do differently he, he, he always says like I would hire a programmer or, or like like have someone help me because it feels. and it, I think for founders it's really important to to do as much as you can yourself because it really helps you understand the dynamics of your business especially customer support I think customer support is like the most important thing you should do but um, the programming and Bertus is, is really good at like thinking and, and, and working through problems but there was a lot of groundwork, footwork to be done, which I, I'm, I'm not a professional programmer, but for a professional programmer it, it would, have, would have been easy probably, but for him it was reading, working, reading, frustration. So we had two lamps at this office where we worked at, and like in the first two or three weeks prior to the launch, I think both of those lamps got destroyed by a book that was flying through the room, because it was always like, no, it doesn't work again. Um, yeah, so, but... Like, gladly, he, he, he put himself through that, um, through that ton of work because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to, to finance the whole thing, probably. Yeah, we were bootstrapped from, from the beginning. When, when you launch, how many, how many orders did you get? I mean, how did you get to know, to get to know people out there? Did they, like, I guess friends and family started dying, but um, how did you get the word out? So, the fun thing about friends and family is um, you might not, I think it, it was, it, I'm not good with, with scientific theories, but I think it was Granovetter, the one who invented, who came up with the five degrees of separation that yeah. you know. And, and I think Granovetter also um, came up with the concept of weak and strong ties. Like when you, in, in career advancements, it's always about um, the weak ties. Like you would never ask your best friend, like, do you have a job for me? But if your best friend knows a recruiter, you, you'll be like, could you do an intro? Because I would like to ask him. Same happened with my muesli. Like, um, a lot of really close friends, I think, um, please do, but haven't ordered yet um, in the last <laughs> 10 years. Um, but like, like um, but they talk people, about you of, and their referrals. Hopefully, um, and hopefully they say good things about me and the company, but like it's, it's not the close friends that are your first customers usually, it's like um, the ones that, that know your friends and like, hey, have you seen that website? Yeah, I know the guy. Did you order? No, I didn't. So, um, we, I don't remember the exact number of orders, but um, the, we didn't have a content management system back then. We had, um, basically for, for the nerds, and we did have a send mail script running on the server that would send an email like every time an order would come in. So we, we had the familiar ping. And, and so back, we, we moved offices on the day of the launch. Please. Don't ever do that, it was really stupid. Um, and so we had to, those were the days, we had to plug in the computer into a phone line, really start it up, like, and then see, whoa, orders, bing, bing, bing. And yeah, I think we, we got a couple, and, and it, it, it really grew from there. So it was, it was fun, I mean, watching, watching the emails come in was really cool.
And, and uh, did you do the packaging yourself, or did you like mix the muesli at the time yourself? I guess you didn't have yet a, a warehouse or. So, so we had to have a small workshop due to um, food laws in Germany. You can produce food on a, on a large scale in your apartment. So we had a, a small um, workshop that we rented. And was, it wasn't that easy finding someone who would rent um, a workshop to a newly founded muesli company um, that would do everything different you know, and sell online. But we found a local shoe merchant who had like a spare room and he said, um, like if, if as long as you pay the rent you can have it and yes we mixed all the muesli's ourselves for i think six seven eight weeks and then we hired the first um university students to help us but i think philip um who was the king of, of mixing i think he <laughs> that was his title chief of mixing <laughs> exactly officer. so he, chief mixing officer he was probably <laughs> really mixing for the first two or three years like not on a, on a daily basis but like we would still have out christmas 2011 2012 2013 i think and because there were it, it was it, it's so unpredictable like what will happen if, if a tv team comes and features you like you can't possibly be prepared for that at the time were you having also this 80 ingredients that provide i don't know how many 566 quadrillion of varieties of muesli or were you restricted in terms of no like of, of course like we, we did change ingredients along the way because we figured out for example that um i don't know the english translation but for the for the um cake freaks out there orangeat and, and citronat so like candied fruits um don't make sense at all because if you put them in the muesli you will just get like a big chunk of, of muesli out of the one when the customer opens it so though we got rid of those we got rid of the gummy bears the gummy bears were cool in terms of pr but not too many people wanted gummy bears for their children. In, in with milk, yeah. I wasn't a father back then, so I didn't know that <laughs> you that, that it, you should really focus on on the on the more healthy ingredients, probably. And we introduced hemp, which led to um, Google banning our ads for a small time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so we, we we constantly try to to innovate because again, I think product and, and really working and focusing on, on product is pertinent and really really important for for every startup and, and when you started um what did you think like you underestimated you said already like kind of the, the everything <laughs> no I, I think for us it we were really lucky because there were there was a lot of traffic coming our way due to bloggers due to pr due to journalists due to um, marketing and and that really helped us you know to to learn and it really helped us so we, we could mess up small things like for example you would think when you start a startup that um, that a lot of stuff that you think is easy turns out to be actually quite difficult so one of the major challenges we faced was to find boxes that were suitable for those for those tubes and so we had to so the actually, the story of the tube is actually quite interesting. Yeah, but at, at first you didn't want a tube. <laughs> no, but we, we didn't know that there were tubes actually. But um, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But so we used these like wrapping plastic for the first tubes, and it, and they looked like a football, and and it was and it really I think it really addressed the postman basically convincing him that it should be treated like a football as well. So um, the boxes didn't really yeah, but lots of boxes. Came, were, were broken when the customers opened them. So, and um, only through blogging to by by talking to all of our customers, like please help us, we need boxes. Did we really find find fart cartons? And that for me led to the realization that never underestimate anything. You know, it's 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 all difficult, and you can basically like um, nerd your way into every subject there is. You you could probably spend six weeks finding the perfect box so but but at some point you just have to leapfrog some some things and just <coughs> go with it i guess and, and this box didn't look like this at the beginning right no i mean so the the reason why we have these these tubes so when you go to a conference to a marketing conference usually where they charge a lot of money where people only speak in hashtags like disruptive and um, rule breaker and um, they they always say this is a 
category killer. <laughs> and, 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 but the reason why we have these round tubes, which we came to love, of course, along the way, was that we went to... The good thing about Germany, um, for, in terms of startups, is everything in Germany can be solved by going to a fair. So we went to Fachpark in Nuremberg, and we, we looked at all these... Um, we, we had our Abitur suits, and they were way too big, and so, so we would go to the first booth and we would sit down and we said, we would like to order boxes, say, 5,000. And the people were like, if we push this little button here on this machine, like 10,000 boxes will come out per minute. And <laughs> I don't think we have a deal. And like, and, but, but at the very end, we found someone who, who made these tubes and, and that's when, when it really hit us. Like, that's a cool idea. Hubertus had also done some um, prototypes with tubes and we thought, yeah, let's go with the tubes because they also enabled us to really mass customize the product by hand because we could just open and put the ingredients in and close them without buying too much of machinery. So they made sense all the way and yeah, they, I think they were part of the product success because they're very unique for, for a muesli. Part of the, of, the, of the key differentiator, I guess. Um, mm. And people remembered you through, through that unique uh, design. I think what also struck me uh, when I read articles about my muesli is the, the transparency of the humility um, when you started. Um, I, 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 kind of, I read um, something on the website at first where you say, and this is going to be in Deutsch, so um, sorry for my French accent, but we wissen einfach nicht, was uns erwartet und müssen sicherlich noch ein, einige Abläufe optimieren. Das eine oder andere wird auch schief gehen. Deshalb hoffen wir in den ersten Wochen auf eure Unterstützung und eure Verständnis. And I, did you get a lot of feedback from, from this um, uh, statement on your, on your website from customers trying to help? So we, we really did get lots of, lots of help and, and feedback along the way. And I think, um, like, the, for me, it's, I don't know, it, it, I, I don't do it on purpose, but it's like, what person do you want to be? Do you want to be like someone who's actively looking for help and, and, and trying to, to engage and, and trying to have a conversation with customers? Or are you going to be like, this is the best music in the world, you buy it or screw you. So that, that it's not going to work that way. And, and I'm glad we chose um, door number one because it, it really helped us you know, to grow with lots of feedback and lots of valuable tips along the way. And, and being close to, to getting a customer experience rather than just being also uh, a product. Um, let's go a little bit into the, the business itself. Um, how, um, how did you approach um, marketing and, and PR? So is, is your network or your background, because you're, you're a journalist by um, studying, um, did, did that help you? Did you, so your network help you to get the word out there that you were building a startup and, and, a, and a food product? I, I think that um, there's a book called Baked In that basically says um, a lot of the the marketing and, and the PR can already be baked in into the product. Like, if if you're if you manufacture a Tesla and and you're Elon Musk, you don't have to hire a PR agency. That there's your PR. And and I think with my muesli, it, we we burned Tesla, of course, but it we really were we we created a category. And one of the I think greatest marketing books of all times, The 22 Mutable Laws of Branding by Al Rees and his daughter Laura Rees, like his, he always says like, focus, 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 and try to create a new category. And I think that's what we did. We created a new category called Mass Customized Muesli, and that leads to a strong, unique selling proposition. I think this is like the most important part for every story, like what's the angle, what's new, what's, what's really cool about the product. And, and I think, check, we, we have a new product. And then I, I, of course, from my apprenticeship, I knew how to write a press <coughs> release and I knew how to write texts um, that probably aren't Pulitzer worthy, but um, they, they help to get the message across. And, and Hubertus and Philip, they're also very good at, at telling the stories. So second, we, we were able to really communicate what the product was about in, in like a few sentences. And third, um, we, we didn't have too much time to focus on too many things. So what we really focused on was like people and, and people relations, and it didn't matter to us whether it was a blogger or a customer, 
we wanted everyone to really have a great customer experience and really try to care about people, like to, to answer every email and be it like the smallest blogger with only two readers. If he said, I want to try the product, we said, of course, here's our press kit or here's information. And I think that really helped us to, to get the message across. But most importantly, fourth was that um, back then it wasn't only a new product in terms of a strong USP, but it was also a completely new category. No one wanted to do e-commerce in 2007. Everyone wanted to start social networks. Social network. um, and so it was really, I think a lot of people thought it was a joke, you know, they, and they wanted to, to try it to actually see it if, if, if it's a prank or not. And I, I think, I mean, um, you, ver you were kind of in slightly innovating in the way you were uh, doing marketing because um, what now you call PR or blogger, you can call that influencer marketing, or what you call, um, you know, providing a customer experience and, and marketing your product without being so promotional. Uh, you could see this as like content marketing, so you know, like having this um, live uh, tele shopping by by Facebook, having a my Muslim sighting, I think, is also another type of marketing. Is that did that help to get the message across without sounding too promotional? Well, I think um, Hubertus once said, if, if I remember correctly, like we did lots of marketing without doing any advertising, and I think like. And um, every call to customer support is a brand campaign. Like, if you call customer support, and I, I call lots of customer support hotlines, because like every time I have a problem with a product, I want to find out like how do they tackle it. And I think it's always funny, like, take an airline. If you write them on Twitter or Facebook, you get usually a response within one minute. Yeah. If you call them, it takes 30 minutes. If you write them an email, it takes two weeks. Uh -huh, and that doesn't sense. make any sense. It, I, I don't understand it. Like, it's the same with lots of transportation companies like um, and so we try to have like um, seamless customer support across all channels of course with emails it's difficult because if there's like a tv coverage then you will get 2000 emails instantly or something and you can't answer them at the same time you will have like 10 tweets but it shouldn't take two weeks um, and what i just like i think it's of course, like making a Muslim newspaper, doing good newsletters, having great content on the website and everything. Of course, it helps to get the message across. And content marketing is the buzzword of, of, of our marketing generation. But the problem is, what do you do when you just start? Like, because I think it's, it's not easy, but it's easier to have marketing when there's an audience and when there's a budget. But what do you do with no budget and no audience? And that. I think is the challenge for every founder and again I think it's all about a unique selling proposition really focusing on on, a niche. on on like not too many things at once but really tackling like one two or three channels at the most really starting very small and then doing lots of groundwork like if you watch Gary Vaynerchuk he will tell on, online he will always tell people like Instagram is hard work it, it takes two or three hours a day to really grow your audience and I think that's that's important. And it's also about testing at a small scale and trying to fi figure out if this works, and then people think quite. Sure, and I think like in the beginning, um, it's it's not always about you know doing lots of Excel work and having cohorts A, B, C, and then but, but it's 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 more about like really tapping into channels like really really small and just seeing do do I get What's any response exactly? And of course, like if if you have someone who's also good. At, at the the mathematical the, the Excel stuff and really tracks your customer acquisition costs and all these things, then I think you have a pretty solid foundation of, of building your audience. But basically, again, it's about having a cool product with a very unique selling proposition. And I, I've heard a lot of founders, successful founders, who started that also to be part of the customer support team, just to understand what the customer thinks about the, the product. Is that something that you've also done at the beginning? I would rephrase there shouldn't be a customer support team, you know, and you shouldn't be part of that you should be customer support. And because it's, and, and this of course could be like, like a book buzzword, and like, well, it's very, and it, uh, that's the greatest feedback you will ever get, blah, 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 but like, it's, it's true. It's like these people actually bought your product. And so and they found it, they tried it, they paid for it, and then they have a problem, and they we will tell you. It. Yeah, and they, and this is like the most valuable source you will ever have, 
And I think it's so cool if you do it yourself in the beginning because, like, first of all, it's fun because you actually get to talk to people who buy your product, and and second, yeah, you will learn a lot from it. So you're, um, you know, started with three people. Um, you're, you're, you and, and, and two friends from university. Um, you are now at um, 850 employees. Um, so how do you? Um, how do you keep up the startup culture, the, the spirit alive when you're such a big company? Well, that, that's, that's a very good question, a very difficult one to answer because um, it's, like, it's, it's not about having table tennis in every room and it's not about, you know, and it's, and it's difficult when you get older because if everyone in the company is 23 and you say, on a Friday evening, you say, well, we should really finish this feature on the website, and afterwards we'll set up a barbecue and have free drinks and meat. And everyone who is 23 and is like, yeah, awesome. And these days it's like, oh, I gotta pick up my son from Kita, and then, um, yeah, we have, um, we're invited to this wedding, and it's a destination wedding, we have to leave like at noon, but we can finish it next week. Um, and and that, in, a lot of people are sad when they hear that, they're like, we should go back to square one. But, I don't know. So how do we keep up the startup spirit? By, I think, by, by changing the spirit actually. Like what, what startup spirit about? It's about love. It's about loving your product, and it's about doing doing work that's fun and that also enables you to do other things you like. Like why do you work? You work because you wanna you have a passion for something and you hopefully want to 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 also and be passionate about the stuff you do. And, and that's not always easy because not everyone has like a job that he's perfectly passionate about. But I think if we if we keep on producing great products, if we really keep on, you know, innovating, if we if we also keep to be a successful company where people have like safe jobs and where we don't have to tell people, um, sorry this didn't work like every day, and that, that you will always have screw ups, you will always have mistakes, you will always have to change directions at some point but like if, if we try to do the best we can then I think that the startup spirit um, will change into something that's called a good company spirit and I think we have that. And I, I guess it's uh, trying to innovate and to try to re not reinvent the wheel but just try to find some additional uh, ways of, of selling your product as well so um, you came up with uh, then in the t at the time your own stores. Um, you were also sold in supermarkets. You're still, and you're also doing B two B. So you're selling also to corporates. How is this? Uh, how did that come up um, from an, a, a startup that wanted to be purely e-commerce? Um, and how do you keep up with this kind of multi-channel distribution strategy? So well, really connecting the dots when it comes to multi-channel. Like, what's the customer the lifetime value across channels? Like, what's the best way? Um, in, in terms of acquisition, it, it's really tough, and I think that that a lot of like, I think that how how the retail landscape changes um, at the moment, it's 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 really difficult for all merchants. Like, and um, I think we we've, we've talked about that the last time we met. But I and um, my my two co-founders and I we went to New York for a fair and we walked down Fifth Avenue a few weeks a few, few weeks or months ago, and we saw like thirty empty shops and like. 10 blocks, and we're like, this is fucking Fifth Avenue, like, why are there 30 empty shops, so what, what's happening here? And so, we face the, the very same challenge, like, you, there, there always has to be a reason why you open a certain channel, not just in terms of, like, quick sales or business development, and we did supermarkets because we think in a country, especially Germany, where more than 95% of of all groceries or, or food groceries are sold through supermarkets, you should be available in a supermarket. And stores, when we when we were close to turning 30, we realized that we it wasn't enough to eat healthy breakfast. We also had to have healthy lunch. So we wanted to open up a salad bar, but I had never done commercial or real estate law. So I, I signed a rental contract that had this exit clause, and. It turns out that you can actually use an exit clause when it's in a contract, and so we had we bought like a coffee machine, a refrigerator, and everything, but you didn't get um, the store. So Philip, one of my co-founders, said, "I do have a store. It's smaller and it's not really in a in a, in a high frequency location, but we could open a muesli store." And I was like, "What are we going to sell there? We are a mass customization company." And he said, or Roberta said, 
and we could use the data that we gather from our orders to come up with cool premixes. Let, let's just try it. That's how we, how we came up with our first stores. It wasn't this big strategic decision, but rather like, again, try it and, and hopefully it will work. Well, it seems it worked because you're now in like um, 60 stores. We're, we're at about 50 at the moment and, and it's still a lot of testing and, and seeing what works and, and really um, always keeping up the pace because like we, we all accept the fact that a website changes on a minute basis. Like you do A-B testing and, and you will change a headline within minutes just to improve conversion. But with a store, a lot of people still have the mindset that it can take say 10 years until a store has to be renovated or refurbished. And, and that, of course, can't be true for times like these. And so our store lands, landscape also has to change quickly. But even for a startup like us, it's, it's still very difficult to, to, you know, to, to find a good, good pace, to find a good way. But we're, we're testing, we're, we're trying. And I think, um, yeah, the stores, I love them so much because, like, is there anything cooler than, you know, this was an idea when we were students. And you come into a store at Victualien Markt in Munich where I bought cheese with my mother and when I was a student and, and you have a store that's full of your own product and I think that's still one of the coolest that's things to experience. <laughs> your mom is very proud of us. Um, but the, <laughs> the, the, how much of, um, of the revenue you're making is done through the stores or through online or supermarket? Or can, you, can you share that with us? So what I can share is that um, online is still our strongest channel um, and that the stores and the website accounts for way more than 50% of the sales. Mm -hmm. and, and we think um, though that you shouldn't focus too much on, on numbers. Like the first thing that everyone asks us is like, how big is the market if he has a VC background? If he doesn't have a VC background, he's usually like, what's what's the turnover? Like, or if he's he has That's a marketing background, like, <laughs> what what are, what are your um, customer acquisition costs? And I think, um, people so focus. You're not going to tell us how much. No, I won't. Okay. But um, <laughs> people focus way too much on metrics. You know, you should really focus on products. And the good thing is, if you don't know the numbers, your spine when you walk by that product in the supermarket won't tell you it's a big or a small company. It will hopefully tell you. I like the interview with the founder very much. I should try the product. So that's, that's what your spine or your brain should tell you. So cool. Um, and but your online store are actually quite a good channel also to um, talk to your clients, I guess, talk to customers that um, are also buying online. How much um, data can be kind of overlap between online and offline? Are you able to to see the conversion or to see you know um, from offline to offline which are the customers that are buying? It's. Like we only at at this point we have a lot of educated guesses, but um, the how how customer journeys work across channels is is still I wouldn't say mystery because of course like there are lots of data points, but and um, I still all of us really haven't figured out like how are we going to buy food in the next ten years? We just don't know. Like, does does it make sense to order from? From, from all these, these companies that offer food you delivery. Know, a lot of different theory depending on uh, which founder you talk to. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> it's, it's like... We're here, we don't have any kitchen anymore. And that's why I, I always like, uh, I always say, I don't, I don't know what, what the future will bring, so I, I would rather not say anything because it's going to be wrong anyway. But you, you're able to kind of identify specific trends, right? Because you are actually like at the forefront of knowing what people want sure, for like, customers. Like, what we want for breakfast. So first of all, people have tons of choices and where they want to buy food. And that's difficult. So and that's something I see and you really have to be or strive for awesomeness at, at what you do. Like if you order apples online and they will bring you rotten apples and you will probably never order from the vendor again you will say, I knew it and online food delivery doesn't work. And and second, people love to change channels. Like we all if if we want to buy say shoes, there might be someone in this audience who says, I go to the very same shoe store like since 30 years, but my educated guess would be that we all shop online and offline, vice versa. When we're on vacation, we tend to shop offline. When we're not on vacation, we're like stressed out, so we we, we order through through online vendors. And what I'm what I'm I, I, I think to, to summarize it, um 
we, we all really have to see how the retail or how this online offline thing will turn out um, for the years to come. Will there ever be like an endpoint where we say, ah, this is how they do it? And um, I don't think so. So we're, we're open-minded and we really don't want people to focus on our online channel or focus on supermarkets. We want every channel to be awesome and we think that people should be able to change it like as they like. And your online channel is helping you to get to the ready ready mix that you're selling offline. Sure, like so because to, to the trends that what type of ingredients people like. Exactly, but because the, the, the curse of market research, like do you eat healthy? Will you vote for Trump? And a lot of people will say no, I would never. And I, of course, I do eat and healthy. Right. But if you look at like um, the, like the trash can, you'll find lots of love pizza recipes or, or whatever and and so I think th th of course like our data really helps us to, to determine like how are we orders working if someone orders strawberry is he more likely to reorder than someone who doesn't order strawberry and of course that data is very valuable and, and helps us to to skip um, the part where we stand in front of a shelf with a clipboard and ask people like do you like strawberry and everyone likes strawberry if you ask them I would say so um, yeah, the, the data is really important. And so what are the favorite um, variety of, or mixes that you've, you've seen in the past? Is there a lot of overlap of, uh, across customers? Uh, yes, use? of course, but, but um, one thing that's important to know about my muesli is that I think um, the success of my muesli has a lot to do with like um, targeting tons of niche markets. So we, we're not trying to tell people mango is the only fruit you should have in a muesli because we think if you're an athlete, if you're old, if you're young, if you're a female, male, if you're a child, if you're not a child, if you do sports, if you don't do sports, there is a muesli for you out there. You just have to find it and we help you find it and to reach your goal, whatever it is, be it just great taste or like, like um, losing, losing weight or whatever you're, you're focusing on. And and so there are favorites like like oats always everyone most people like oats raisins will always be like um, a reason for divorce or not and um, then apple everyone loves apple and of course there are seasonal favorites like um, the Christmas granola works great at Christmas but if we sell it through the summertime people would be like what's in the Christmas granola actually so it's basically the the um, pumpkin and and then Christmas spice that that's really um, that's that's a gingerbread it's spice, a and, and you can taste it with glue wine. There are, there are videos out there, I think, and but I wouldn't recommend it. What's your favorite? See, I'm I'm the kind of as my two, as are my two co-founders. We test a lot of things, and um, so we get to taste a lot of different mueslis. But um, I I like all of our mueslis basically. I'm not too nuts that much. Um, I'm I'm more of a chocolate and, and fruity type of guy. So, um, but. I, I eat the Christmas granola for breakfast at, at the moment, for example. So I, I, I like all of them. Seasonal. Um, so you kind of achieved this um, being bootstrapped, um, um, self-finance, uh, with uh, maybe just two angels at the beginning, uh, Lukasz Gadowski and, and Kolja uh, Eggenscheid. Um, I, how, did you, how did you manage to um, build this growth um, without having a VC or an external investor uh, more of your category. So, someone asked me on LinkedIn the other day, like, do you think that um, a business or, or thinking about your business model is important um, when when you know p building the, the the battle plan for your startup? And I was like, yeah, it's it's really really important, I think. And I think so first we, we did make money with every sale, and that was important because that's how we financed. The, the business and um, so e-commerce if if you do your pricing right you're hopefully gonna make money with every sale so um, and second we really got a lot of traction through PR and um, and third um, I think Hubertus has the number in, in the book we wrote earlier this year and I think it's 35 or 40 percent don't quote me of of new customers are still word of mouth or referrals so we so low cost equity exactly and that's that's how we really managed to to grow the business by really bootstrapping our lives, like living in in not too fancy apartments and not driving fancy cars and, and not doing all this kind of stuff and 
eating lots of muesli along the along the way, <laughs> and and by by really focusing on product and, and and really getting the word out, like really trying to push PR. And today, as you said, and very well, it might be influencer marketing. Maybe we'll tackle Instagram these days. Um, and it's a lot of groundwork. Like if you want to start a business on through Instagram. Of course, the big influencers will chart or will want to see money, so you'll have to use the, um, there's a term for everything, I guess, the micro influencers. <laughs> and uh, it's, but it takes a lot of convincing, lots of messaging, lots of like, and they refer to 50 people, exactly. And I think there is no way around the groundwork if you don't have to, lots of capital. But would you recommend for an entrepreneur to wait as long as possible to, before getting external investors on board? It's like when you sell a car and you tell the person on the other side, I need money tomorrow, please buy this car, you know, it's going to be much more difficult, but as leading back, I have a hundred people wanting to buy that car, you can have it, but it's a classic. Um, so, and I think the same goes for a startup, like if you have sales, if you have a track record, if, if, if things are going in the right direction, if you can show growth, and investors will line up um, best case. Um, you're investing in startups, you, you, you would probably say them, but if someone is really desperate for funding, um, it's not they, a good approach. Yeah, but, but there could be two reasons. Like he could be Sheldon Cooper. Like he he, he could be like it, it could be really difficult for him to leave the apartment. Like I have the greatest idea ever, but I can't leave the apartment. Please fund me. Might be a good idea. Um, or second, he probably just like didn't figure out his business model yet, and that might be too early for an investor. But I'm not an expert at, 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 at this investing game. But I I would always recommend like try to show at least some traction and um, because it, it makes makes it easier for everyone. But I, I found what what I found quite unusual is you went um after the banks. So you actually got bank loans. And this for a startup kind of from a VC perspective that's quite <laughs> unusual, but I think from a business perspective it makes complete but sense. But how did you approach the banks? I mean I always I mean you you must have had unique economics which were working as you said or some uh, profitability already where you Breaking even already. You say it like it's a like it's a you were you had I mean, it's fair. I, mean, I, mean, I still have startups every day. No, like we we're, we're a really classic business. Like we, we we sell stuff for more money than we bought the ingredients for, and we do a lot of magic along the way. And and you I, were still doing same with delivery or or so or like you know being mm -hmm. able to to do this so, has a cost. But but I think if you approach a bank and. Um, Maybe one of one of the bankers we work with is, is watching. I think it's um, correct me if I'm wrong in the comment section, please. But it's like, is there really a revenue model, mm -hmm. and can you show profitability, and do you believe in, in what you see? Is it just numbers, and do the people not feel those numbers? Yeah, Excel said that this is going to happen next year, or are the people across the table really convinced that this will happen? And that's I think Philip and um, my co-founder. He has this great ability of really, he has a really good gut feeling for numbers. Like he, he always knew what we could afford or what we can afford. And of course that helped tremendously with the banks because um, he really convinced them to, to believe in our idea. But um, the first idea Hubertus and Philip had, which was um, they started a, a small business during university and they started a video store, a DVD rental store with, with fingerprint rentals. And that they looked a very long time for a bank that would finance that kind of business. So it's not always easy, of course. Maybe because it was more tech oriented. Yeah. Um, but you finally decided to get an external investor yeah. on board. Uh, why is that? So we thought that um, for this late stage that we're in, in terms of like the startup. Yeah, that was um, in 2015. 2015 we, we were really looking um, at, at lots of different options. Like we, we looked at like more bank loans, we looked at a capital increase from an external investor and that was um, the direction we, we, we took and we're really happy with that decision. Our investor is Inui from Hamburg and, and their approach is, is very unique because they're not like your typical PE fund that will just invest money, they also have a very entrepreneurial mindset and they have cool entrepreneurs working with them. And one of them, Stefan Bernsing, who's really big in the food industry. If you're a food professional, you've, you probably know Stefan Bernsing or the Bernsing Food Family. He's, he's also counseling us um, on a lot of topics. And for us, it just made sense to do the capital increase at that point because like, there are so many challenges ahead that we face. 
one, um, growing offline um, internationally, especially, is expensive. It's it's difficult because you some you you suddenly have things you never had before as a startup. You have people asking you, can I, f like like. And what's what's the hotel rate? And, and, and so constantly people are traveling, and that and that was like a small detail, but that changes it, your your mindset. You're like, wow, we're international now. Second, um, we know that our workshop or our production plant, if you want to call it that, and um, we, we really love what we do, and we want to keep doing it. But we have to create resources to be able to really meet demand, and because we're growing. And so we have to invest a lot into production facilities and automation, and I guess. Automation, like like like, uh, we don't really like the term automation because we like the term like making it easier for everyone. And third, and <laughs> <laughs> it's still customized. So no, but what I mean by that is like, we don't want to like get rid of people and have machines instead. But if you have like someone who who has to touch a box that like three times before the lid is on, as opposed to he can grab it, the lid is put on and he can put it in a box, it's much easier for him and it's much easier for everyone else because like the, the ceiling will be perfect and everything. And so we really believe in like um yeah like like trying to improve the small details as well as the as the big picture. And then um, third, internalization in general um, is expensive. So and usually undermined. Yeah, and we think that right. our business can be and, and should be an international business as well. Maybe you can just share a few uh, seconds um, how your production plan works because I was kind of a very uh, um, and I found that unique. So that you have basically a scanner um, and this is how you manage to get this custom. So I think a lot of people who visited our production facility when we first set it up thought that there was a machine, but what we did was we had these 80 Tupperware things filled with ingredients and we had um, the, uh, the Germans will know it, Zweckform etiketten, so like, like um, inkjet um, labels where we printed all the ingredients and I think there isn't one person on the planet that has like eight swag form etiquette on a sheet of paper and is able to print eight perfect stickers. Like six of them are good, one is like all right and the eighth one is always like not working. So we have to use a pen and like write, dear Rita, your strawberries are in the muesli, but our printer was too stupid. So, and, and that was really cool because people kept writing emails like, it's so nice, you wrote a little thing on the back of the tube about the strawberries, thank you so much. Very so, so first the plant was really like bootstrap and, and then we wanted to build this machinery but we weren't able to afford it. And then Hubertus remembered that one of his oldest friends, um, Geert, who's from Ostfriesland, so between Lower Bavaria and Ostfriesland, I think that's like the farthest distance you can travel in Germany, um, that he wanted to, or, studied to be an engineer and he, he was starting a business building machines and he was the one um, building our very first machine and it works with barcode scanners, the tubes come in, they're labeled and then they go from barcode to barcode, they're shaken at the end, the lid is put on top and then off they go. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. I found. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's still, it, it's still so impressive for me like every time because like of course when I, let alone that there is a database and that that it works and there are people running around with an iPad checking if the machine works. So I think it's the most amazing thing, you know, but of course I've gotten used to it a little bit because I see it so much. So that's that's how it, the the investment round um, was the used for um, growing internationally and, and the production plan. Um, but what, what we're going to use it for, like it's um, so so we still have we, we still have lots of lots of work to do, but of course um, I think also um, if you're more than eight hundred people, financial stability is also very very important because as said there will always be times when, yeah there, there will always be times when you make a wrong decision and that will impact um, the company maybe maybe jobs um, which are, which I don't hope but. Um, you should, at some point, I think you're you're not responsible for yourself anymore, of course, but for lots of people, and you should strive to really reduce the risks. That's when you start being a, a grown-up from a, a startup, I guess. Maybe, yeah, or, or start being responsible because you have to. I, I don't know, it's it's like, um, it, and it, it really helped us in terms of, um, yeah, we're good sleepers, but it, it helped us to be like, 
that feels just feels good, you know, to, to, to have money exactly to, to have more financial stability. So you can sleep at night. So what's next? I guess um, you have plenty of ideas uh, in, in in your mind for the future of, of my Muslims. So when we started the business, um, I don't really believe, um, and I think I sound like the biggest Sam Altman Y Combinator fan that's out there, but Sam Altman. Um, in this very good lecture about how to start a startup, he also says like, I don't know too many startups that, um, or successful startups that started with a pivot. Like for those of you that haven't read Eric Ries's Lean Startup um, book, he, Eric Ries argues that um, you can you start something, um, you put it to market, you get feedback, you pivot a little bit, you put it to the market again, you pivot, feedback. Um, and I think that, is, that approach is working but like the big pivots like changing the business models like every three months and that's something that's usually not going to work and so with my muesli at the beginning we thought will ma is mass customization or holy grail like will there be mass customized dog food mass customized cars from us and um, turns out no muesli it's about muesli and then we tried coffee and which we don't do anymore we tried tea which we still do because we, we think it's very complementary and Generally, all the products we'll put out in the future will have a probably premium breakfast muesli or, or at least muesli relation. So we, we just put out milk, and which is a milk alternative, um, and, 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 and that's the hipster really milk, well. as I, I read. Yeah, you could say that. I mean, it's like um, the funny thing is it's a milk for no milk, right? Exactly. Like. And, and I think it's so funny that a lot of people like, um, and that's very, that's a very German thing um, to do. I think um, Germans like to to point at people, you know, that that are really conscious about what they eat. Be like, you're a hipster because you don't eat pork. That's I what know. I read. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm no, a German. Um, but it's 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 doing quite well, and we're also um, working on muesli bars, and they will come out in a few days, and and yeah, lots of lots of cool food products on the horizon. I hope. Um, as a as an individual, um, what um, I, I heard that you're making some investments as well as a as a business angel. Um, what drives your your interest? I think investments always sounds like the big check people were holding in TV shows in the eighties. You know, like mm. um, so we're not we're not the ones you talk to for the big checks because we we still have a company that we haven't sold. So um, we're like. Um, but, but other people, is that on the horizon to like, actually sell it? No, because point? we love it so much. I think it's like, um, if you find something you really love, you know, you should hold on to it. Um, so um, I don't know what will happen in the, in the next uh, 10 to 20 years, but at the moment it feels like the very right thing to do for me and my co-founders. Um, but, so we're not the guides to talk to for the big checks, but I think um, we do have, we can, we can give advice when it comes to fast moving consumer goods, when it comes to um, selling through retail or, or selling through multi-channel uh, or doing multi-channel business models. And if, if, if some founders want that advice, um, for, for we, we sometimes you know, find an agreement, but uh, since we're so, in terms of like our, our time, we spend so much time with our business and um, we we help about one to two startups a year, most probably. With investment, but yeah, like investment business, I, 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 I like the term business angels because it like it doesn't sound like there's lots of money involved, but it sounds like of course, um, like they have responsibility to come up with something, be it advice or, or a little money. But um, yeah, that's that's what we do. But um, we also learned that it's what we're good at is 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 focusing on this company and scaling that and. Or doing a little bit on the side, but as said, only a little. Just um, for fun, when it's a it's a product that you. Yeah, like. for fun. Yeah. For fun, always sounds like gambling. Like uh, for, <laughs> it, there are a lot of reasons like to really understand different business models to to also widen our perspective on, on what other people are doing, and also because I think um, I don't want to sound like. Um, about that, but I think it's it's really important that people start businesses in this country and in every country. And I think it's cool that when there are people out there with great ideas, they they should be supported, and we should all support each other. That's why I really try to um, 
you know, um, I'm, I'm still yeah. trying to find a way to, for, for how to build a community of, of founders. And so today I started a LinkedIn group um, for, for founders. And, and of course, there might be a Xing group as well, since we're at Burda. And, uh, but um, about like about four founders. I still don't know what to do with it, but let's see, you know, and maybe this will lead to great talks about entrepreneurship in general and stuff like that. Well, we look forward to it. I think it has no memory yet. You could be the first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, building a strong community of founders. Do you think anyone can become an entrepreneur? Well, that's a very tough question to answer. I think um, in some way, yes. Um, but I don't think everyone needs to become one, you know? If it, it has to feel right for, for yourself. And if you, if you read Thinking Fast and Slow, you'll know that um, there are some decisions you make with your head and there are some decisions that should be left to your gut feeling. And I think that's most definitely a gut feeling decision. Well, um, so I wanted to thank you so much for coming tonight and for sharing this incredible story. Um, to uh, just thank you on behalf of Startup Grind. Uh, it's not breakfast, it's chocolates, but um, it's just a little bit of a thank you uh, note. Thank Local you very much. Charlene wow, with, with Startup mass Grind. customized um, chocolate with my Muesli and Startup Grind logo Ooh. from Eddie Seidel, which yeah. they have been around for decades and now they're innovating, <laughs> which is cool. Exactly. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Um, I would like to thank very much uh, Bora Ford and Bora Bootcamp for hosting us uh, tonight and for um, supporting us with the food and the drinks. I would like to thank you, you guys, for coming. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. I would like also to thank my team, uh, so Franz, um, Calvin and Raphael, who is uh, supposed to be in the back, uh, for organizing this, because without all of you guys and all of the support, um, this would not be possible. Um, the next Startup Grind uh, is going to be our um, first year anniversary because we started uh, exactly December last year. Um, and we will do, of course, um, this along uh, a Christmas party we, where we invited our past guest speakers. So I guess you might come. You said to me that it was not sure yet. But um, so we invited our, all our past guest speakers to celebrate with us. And that's going to be on the 11th of December at uh, Mindspace. So if you want to register, the event is already uh, online, so you can uh, come and join and celebrate with us. Thanks a lot for coming, and um, yeah, please um, stay with drinks and foods um, to mingle. Thanks. Thanks.